Well, welcome to our introduction to identifying and recording ladybirds. I'm extremely excited to see the number of attendees that um, are with us today. That's absolutely fantastic. And particularly on what is in Oxfordshire, a really bright and sunny day and perfect time for recording ladybirds in my garden. Um, we plan that this will be just one hour and it really is an introduction. And if you've got more questions, you can just drop us a line afterwards. But I thought I'd begin, first of all, by thanking um, Caroline Wills Wright, who's behind the scenes here and she sorted out all the logistics for us. And also to say I'm Helen Roy and I co-lead the survey with Pete Brown, who's also online. And we're really fortunate to have Martin with us today. And um, Martin oversees all of the support for the Biological Record Centre schemes and societies, and um, that includes the Ladybird Survey. And he's going to help us by um, chairing the question session. So please do put your questions in the question box if you have any at all. We'll endeavour to answer as many as we possibly can, um, but we will also provide some feedback after the session to give you um, more information. So I'm going to get going and hope all the technology works for all of us. But thank you very much for attending. And I'm looking forward to sharing an hour of ladybird excitement with you. Oh, can't move the slide on for some reason. Great, that's it. So just to give you a quick overview of how this session is going to be, we're going to first of all give a very broad introduction to the ladybird family. And I'm going to try and point out some of the features that can be useful for identification purposes within that. Then we're going to introduce you to some of the conspicuous ladybirds um, in gardens. And we're going to divide that into two sessions with a question and answer in the middle of it. And we're going to give a little bit of information on survey techniques and making a record and then showing you some of the ways in which we've used the data um, over the years. And then we thought it might be really nice to finish with thinking about some of the little inconspicuous ladybirds that um, many of us are less familiar with. And then we'll, we'll give you some information about how to find out more and um, take more of your questions. So looking forward to seeing your questions coming into that um, question section. So beginning with the ladybird family, so it's called the coccinellidae, a beautiful name, and ladybirds are beetles. They have wing cases and often with the ladybirds, they're very brightly colored wing cases or elytra is the technical name. They're classed as being quite small to medium sized beetles. They're usually quite round or oval. That's quite characteristic of the ladybirds. If you were to take a look at their antennae, you would struggle to see them. They're very short clubbed antennae. And this really makes them look quite different to leaf beetles, which can look otherwise quite similar because leaf beetles often have quite long antennae. And if you were to get really close to them and take a look at their little feet, um, you could see how they have four segments, but a third is so small that it's hidden. And, and these are the features that make ladybirds ladybirds. But in terms of us, when we're wanting to identify the ladybirds, the parts that are really interesting for us to take a close look at are the section just behind the head called the pronotum. And that's that sort of shield like plate, um, which I've highlighted on this photo here. And also to look at the leg color, that can be really useful. Of course, the wing color, the wing case color is also very helpful for us. Um, and the size can also be a good indication as to which species it is. But I often find myself when I'm out and about in the field that that pronotum is really a great place to begin with identifying ladybirds because it's often more similar from one individual to another than the wing cases can be. So I thought we'd begin with the seven spot ladybird. And I think of this as a really iconic ladybird and it pretty much always looks the same. So Coxnella septa punctata, and I should say we're including small distribution maps on each photo, um, just so you get an idea of where you might find them um, across um, the UK and into Ireland. But the seven spot ladybird, you can see its pronotum marking there with the two white parts on either side. It has seven spots, three on either wing case and one directly behind um, the pronotum. And it pretty much always looks like that. It's quite a large ladybird um, within the UK. So then we move to a smaller ladybird, the two spot ladybird, Adelia bipunctata. This used to be a really common and widespread species of ladybird, but we've certainly seen declines um, in recent decades. And this is one of the species where it starts to get a little bit more complicated because it can look quite different. It has quite a lot of color pattern um, variation. So the typical form is, as we can see, and it's named after this, this red color form with the two spots. And you can just about make out the marking again there with these on the pronotum with the white flanking 
on either side. But you can see from the little insert that I've added, it can look really quite different and it can have this black color form, which can have four or even six red um, splodges, shall we say, on it. One of the things I look at on this is that it has black legs, but also those front red splodges are extending right to the edge of the wing cases. And that's not always the case for some of the, the different ladybirds that we might see. So this is the 10 spot ladybird, a close relative of the two spot ladybird. Um, it's a very similar size and shape to the two spot ladybird, but it, it does look quite different and it's got brown legs. So that's a really important feature to take a look at. And you can see the pronotum marking again, which I'm going to talk about a lot, is quite sort of speckly, other than in that really strongly melanic form on the left hand side at the bottom. But you can see it has those bars, those red bars on that melanic form. We do see all of these color forms. The tip one is the one with one spot on either sort of shoulder, so to speak, just behind the pronotum, then a band of three on either wing case and then the extra spots behind. Um, so that's the typical form, but we do commonly see that checkered form at the top and also this other form called bimaculata, which is towards the, the bottom. And then this is one that everyone has become very familiar with, the Harlequin ladybird. And this can look very like the 10 spots. So I'm going to take you few, through a few of the features that distinguish it in a moment. But the Harlequin ladybird is another one that comes in many different color patterns. We more often than not see this orangey red background with lots and lots of spots and this M marking behind the head. This one also has the palish brown legs, but you can see it has this dark color form as well, the one with either four red spots or two red spots. But it, those white flanking markings on either side of that pronotum are really important because some of the species that it can look like will not have that. They'll have a totally black um, pronotum. So that's a really useful place to begin and look at. So it is often commonly confused, the harlequin and the 10 spot ladybird. But I often look and see that the spot on the shoulder, so to speak, of course, it's not really a shoulder, but it's a, hopefully a good description. For the harlequin, there's often two spots there. And for the 10 spot, there's often just one. The 10 spot has these three, if you like, rows of spots, the one, the three, and then the few at the back. And the harlequin has four rows of spots. The harlequin is bigger. It's about six to eight millimeters, but a small harlequin can be a similar size to a large 10 spot ladybird. So that's not always um, the most helpful way to look at them. But hopefully that's given you a few pointers to get going with those two species that can look quite similar. This is a beautiful ladybird that I only got my first record of a few days ago, which I felt a bit ashamed of because I saw so many records coming through and it's a very common species, the 14 spot ladybird, a really beautiful aphid feeding ladybird, very square spots, but sometimes those spots can look quite large and then they become um, fused and it can be confused with the um, 10 spot ladybird. But again, look at that marking behind the head. It's very, very different to what we've been seeing with that speckled form of the 10 spot ladybird. And what I kind of think of it, it looks like either sort of like a crown maybe on the 14 spot ladybird or a clenched fist that's been colored in, but it's certainly a solid sort of wiggly pattern. Whereas on the 10 spot ladybird, it's much more commonly um, this sort of more speckly M shape that we see on the pronotum of the 10 spot ladybird. This is an absolutely stunning ladybird. And if you get to see this little ladybird larva, it's also absolutely exquisite. And this is a little hairy ladybird, um, the 24 spot ladybird. It's one of our few species that feeds on plants. It's very common in grasslands. Um, it's not easily confused with anything else. It's that really beautiful, rich reddish color with lots and lots of spots, sometimes with spot fusions that we can see. Um, but it's really quite easy to, to see when you're out and about um, looking through um, the grasses. So we thought we'd move across to a pole and have a bit of interaction in this session. So um, we've not tried this before. We hope it's going to work, but you need to take a look at this species of ladybird. And in a moment, a pole will appear and you'll be able to say which ladybird you think that ladybird is. And um, that's my point to hand across to Pete and um, to thank you very much for listening to that first part. And I'll speak to you again very soon. Over to you, Pete. Great, thank you, Helen. So um, welcome to everybody again. Um, so I'm Pete, I co-lead the uh, the survey with Helen. Um, 
we're hoping that you're seeing the poll now um, and we'll just give you a minute or so to answer that and then we'll move on. If you're not seeing the poll, I think you have to click on the poll and you select poll one, what species is this? And then you can click on it within there, but maybe that's appeared for you. Ah, good. We're just getting used to this. So we think you can now see the poll. I can certainly see it. So we're asking for that last picture, which species is this? Is it a harlequin or a 10 spot or a 14 spot? I can see lots of responses coming in. Wow, you're you're doing you're mostly doing very well on this. Someone I think can't see the poll. There's a little sort of um, poll section on the uh, window, um, certainly in the view that I'm seeing. So perhaps if you try and click on that. If not, don't worry too much. We'll just leave this for a second or two longer. OK, so I think we'll pause the poll there. Uh, I think about two thirds of you have, have seen that. Sorry if you weren't able to, to do that. Um, so Helen, could you just move back to the previous slide, please? And we'll we'll just close this poll. So, uh, well, most of you got this right. I think um, sort of about 80% uh, or so of you got this right. So this is a 10 spot ladybird. Um, so the things to look for, like Helen was saying, uh, it's really the, the number of shoulder spots. So um, one on this one, whereas the harlequin would have two. And the other thing, this is a lot smaller. You can't see that from the slide. But uh, if you put this alongside a harlequin ladybird, this one would uh, look a lot smaller. So I'm going to move on to another six species that are commonly found in gardens. Um, Sorry, we will just take a few questions before we uh, get to that. So, uh, Martin, are, are there any particular questions that you'd like Helen or I to answer at this stage that have come through from the uh, the people? Um, yeah, there's been a, a, a few questions coming through. Thanks to everybody for um, contributing those. Quite a lot of questions about not being able to respond to the poll, unfortunately. Uh, and I'm not quite sure what the answer to that is. I, I think the um, am, I, am I right in saying that you can't actually click on the slide itself? You have to find the little box somewhere else on the screen and click on that. I think that might be the answer for, for some of the problems. Yeah, that's um, right. But we we've had some have, about we have ladybirds as well. Yeah. Um, so one question that came up is, is there a, a difference in the colour pattern between the sexes, between the male and female ladybirds? So, um, Helen, do you want to? Uh, oh, no. <laughs> and I'll, I'll pass that one over to Pete. Sorry, I'm having a technical okay. issue. Can you hear me OK here? So, I'll, I'll, yes, we can hear you, Helen. Okay, I'll, I'll take I'll that question then. So the, the, the short answer is mostly not. Um, the difference between the males and females is usually that the females tend to be a little bit bigger. So if you see them side by side, that's often the case. Um, there are one or two species where you do get slight differences between the, the, the sexes. I think the most obvious one we've noticed is with the 22 spot ladybird that I'm actually going to show you in a minute. And on those, the, the colour of the pronotum uh, tends to be yellow on uh, one sex and white on the other. And I often model up which one's which. Uh, I think it's white on the male. Um, but for most of the species, the, the colour patterns are the same across the sexes. OK, and there's a, a question about the um, the data and the records. I know we, we, I think we're going to talk a little bit about that later on, but um, the question was which organisations make the most use of the Ladybird data and records? 
So Helen, do you want to pick up on that one? Yeah, that's a really excellent question. We use the information a lot within our own research, um, but also um, the data gets passed on to a whole variety of different people. It feeds into, for example, evidence for government around biodiversity and um, some of our modeling people who are looking at the trends of various different species feed it into their models and that provides evidence um, for policymakers. Um, but we're really happy to share the data with anyone and um, to either go through the National Biodiversity Network Atlas or to get in touch with us directly. Um, but yeah, it's really great to see it used. Excellent. Um, perhaps we just pick up on one more question now and, uh, and we've got another question session coming up. Um, let me... So actually it's another question relating to the variation in colouring. Is, is there a regional effect in that variation? I think that's a really fascinating question, actually. And um, there's a lot we don't understand about those colour patterns. We've done a little bit of work trying to see whether or not there's any sort of habitat differences with the colour patterns. And we've seen some sort of tantalising evidence that perhaps, for example, with the harlequin ladybird, um, that the orange colour form doesn't do so well in really dense forests. We have looked at some of the detailing you know, quite, quite deeply. But... Um, We've also, there's also some theories around, for example, with a two-spot ladybird, that perhaps it's mimicking some of the other ladybirds that are around it, um, because it's not very well, toxically well defended, as many ladybirds are quite well defended with a variety of chemicals that aren't dangerously toxic, but are pretty nasty for, for predators, so they don't get attacked so much. But the two-spot ladybird doesn't have the worst of those chemicals, so it's thought that maybe it mimics some of the other ladybirds that are um, more distasteful than it. Um, but that's a really fascinating question. Okay, that's great. So I, I think we, um, should we move on to the next section of the presentation now and great. we'll um, stop the questions again in a short while. Thanks, Martin. So the next species that I'd like to talk about is the 16 spot ladybird and this is the smallest of our um, conspicuous uh, species as we call them so there are 26 of the sort of larger more colorful ladybirds but this is the tiniest of those it's about three millimeters long um, it can be really common and um, you can find them in quite large numbers all together as you can see from this this picture sometimes um, so we've got three common species that can be found in gardens which are yellow and black broadly. Helen's talked about the 14 spot ladybird with its quite rectangular spots. Then there's this one, the 16 spot ladybird. Uh, and there's another one I'm gonna move on to in a minute called the 22 spot. With the 16 spot, I think the distinctive things are the uh, pattern on the pronotum and particularly the kind of dark line down the center, which is quite distinctive and also the fact that the side spots are sort of joined up almost looks like a bit of a dotted uh, joined up line on each side and that's nearly always the case with this species um, so lovely little uh, species much less bright in color than the next one please helen And this is the 22 spot ladybird. So this is a bright lemon yellow color. It's actually one of my favorite ladybirds. It's a little bit bigger than the 16 spot, but still, you know, fairly small. And it's another one that you'll, you'll perhaps find fairly low down on vegetation, maybe particularly on things where there's mildew. So uh, things like hogweed and maybe young oak leaves with mildews on them and so on. Um, because this feeds on those mildew so if you look on the underside of a uh, a hogweed leaf with, with lots of mildew on it you can quite often see this uh, lovely little 22 spot ladybird or or its larvae incidentally i'm going to talk a little bit about a few of the larvae uh, later on these are the juvenile stages of, of ladybirds so that's a, a really quite a common uh, species the 22 spot it normally has 22 spots uh, not always sometimes they have 20 um, so you can't entirely rely on counting spots to get the species, but it's a it's a good indicator. So next one, please. 
we've got several species which are black and red, black with red spots. Now, some of them have white markings on them. So, for example, if you were looking at a, a black and red harlequin ladybird, uh, it's got a number of, it, well, it's got some white patches near the, near the front. There are three species which are always just entirely black with red spots, and the most common one in gardens is this one, and it's called the pine ladybird. Um, but in fact, it, this is uh, not exclusive to pine trees by any means. It's often found on deciduous trees as well, um, but it tends to be on trees. So if you've got a, a, a conifer in your garden or a deciduous tree, it's worth looking for this maybe on the leaves or on the bark. Um, so the other feature about this one is it's got a, a noticeable rim around the edges of the wing cases that perhaps you can see on the big picture here. And the front spots are comma shaped uh, and it always has these four red spots that you can see as on the ones on this uh, tree. If we could have the next one, please. We only really have one species which is bright orange with pale spots, and that's the orange ladybird. Uh, and lovely species to see. This would tend to be found on deciduous trees. Um, it's often got 16 spots, but sometimes 12, really 12 to 16 spots, so that, that varies a little bit. Um, in a moment, I'm gonna compare it to another species which is found in similar places. In fact, if Helen, if you can move the slide on. Um, now this is called the cream spot ladybird. Um, if you just excuse me one moment, I'm just gonna shut my window because I've got lots of planes coming over here. Hold on a second. Sorry about that. There's, uh, very strange, lots of um, aircraft seem to be going over. I wondered if it was disturbing people. Okay, this, this ladybird's called the cream spot uh, ladybird and it pretty much always has 14 spots. And it's usually much uh, darker in color than the orange ladybird, so this lovely uh, brown color. Um, there's a second species which is brown and white, but that doesn't, doesn't tend to occur commonly in gardens. If you could move the slide on, please, Helen. So here we've got the orange ladybird and the cream spot ladybird side by side. And although the colors can be quite different, you do get overlap because sometimes the orange ladybird can be rather darker. Sometimes the cream spot ladybird can be almost quite orangey in color. So we do get lots of people getting a bit confused on these two sometimes. The, the way I find it easiest to tell the, the two apart is by the, the patterning of the spots. So if you look at a cream spot ladybird, you've got a, a, a row of six uh, spots near, fairly near the front, um, all in a, more or less in a straight line, whereas the orange ladybird doesn't have that. So I think that's a, a nice way of telling the two apart if you're not sure. But generally speaking, the orange ladybird is much more bright orange in color. Okay, next one, please. Now this is the last of the big ladybirds that we're going to talk about uh, today. And this is perhaps one that's not quite so common in gardens, but it's a really spectacular one that we thought it would be nice to show you. And you will get it in gardens in some places. This is the eyed ladybird. And it's the UK's biggest species. It's bigger than a harlequin ladybird usually. Uh, so around about sort of eight millimeters, that sort of size. And it's quite dark red and generally has lovely uh, pale rings around the spot. So that's quite a good characteristic to look for on this one. And the markings on the pronotum are also quite distinctive. Um, it also has black legs. So if you're not sure whether you're looking at a big um, orange or red ladybird, and it might be a harlequin or it might be this one, the harlequin ladybird has brown or red legs, whereas the eyed ladybird has black legs. So that can be another useful thing to look for. Uh, this one's normally found on things like pine trees and other conifers. And the next slide, please. So ladybirds have a life cycle pretty much, well, the same principle as, as a butterfly. Uh, so 
uh, they change a lot as, as they go through their, their life cycle. So juvenile ladybirds look like the pictures on the screen or something similar. So these are ladybird larvae. And as they're growing, they shed their skin four times. So they've got four instars. Um, and what we're seeing on the screen here are the last instar larvae. So these are the big ones. And these can be um, quite a, a common thing in gardens and a nice thing to look for. We welcome records of these as well. Um, so the sorts of things to look for when you're trying to identify one larva from another are how spiky they are. So for example, the harlequin ladybird is, has got these big uh, spines on it and it really looks very spiky, very, very well protected. Whereas the two spot ladybird is much smoother in appearance. The other thing to look for is the sort of patterns of the orange or yellowish um, markings on some of the uh, segments. So the harlequin ladybird has got these orange L-shaped markings down each side, whereas the seven spot ladybird, which might be similar in size, has just got four pairs of these little orange uh, spots. So a few of our ladybird larvae. And the next slide, please. OK, so back to the adults, another quick poll. I'm hoping uh, this will work for you. Uh, let's just get that launched. So we're going to ask you which species was that. And we've got several different options. So we'll give you a minute to uh, answer that. There are two answers that are looking particularly popular. So we'll give it a few more seconds. OK, so the most popular vote was for the 22 spot ladybird. And with the 16 spot ladybird as a, as a, as a second choice for, um, for, for some people. Helen, if you could just put the previous slide back on, please. And we'll close the poll. And just on to the next one. Thank you. So um, it was the 22 spot ladybird. That was the correct answer. So um, this one's much more bright in color than the 16 spot. And um, if you remember, the 16 spot had a kind of, the side spots tended to be joined up in a, in a line, whereas these ones tend to be um, separate spots, although it's slightly, slightly blurry on this one. Okay, so well done. Anyway, let's move on to the next slide. So the last little bit from me before we open up to questions again, um, we thought we'd say just uh, for a couple of minutes about some ideas on how it's best to find ladybirds in your garden. So uh, you, you don't need any equipment at all. So despite these two chaps having some things to use, you don't need any of this. Um, uh, so you can just look with your eye and it's sometimes useful to have a hand lens or a magnifier, particularly if your eyes are uh, not brilliant like mine. Kids are often very good at spotting ladybirds, but a little lens can be useful. But just looking by eye. So where to look for them in your garden? And everyone's got completely different gardens. So just look with whatever you've, you've got. If you've got a, a tree or two, then have a look on there on the foliage. Also have a look on the bark. Have a look on the undersides of leaves. And have a look in the uh, sort of lower uh, vegetation that you might have in the, in the garden. Um, Things like grasses and nettles uh, can be really good for some of the different ladybird species. Um, now, what these two people are doing, uh, in fact, it's a picture of me from a few years ago, sweep netting. If you happen to have a net, you can use a net to sweep through low vegetation, such as nettles and grasses, 
to uh, see what you can find and you may find more of the smaller um, less obvious ladybird species if you have a net this is a canvas net you can make them yourself if you want to it's stronger than a butterfly net and the other technique is called tree beating now you some people have a beating tray which is a sort of canvas tray for using but our, our old friend Bob here is using an upturned umbrella uh, preferably a pale color and that doubles up as a really good beating tray so what is what Bob is doing here is tapping the ivy and the insects will fall into uh, to his umbrella and he can then identify them uh, and even if he's not finding uh, ladybirds maybe he'll find uh, lots of other things um, it's good to do this during the day in nice weather ladybirds are active during the day so uh, on a nice sunny afternoon perhaps we'll get one of those over the weekend uh, this might be a, a nice thing to do okay that's it for that slide Helen so if we can go to any more questions again and we'll get Martin back okay thanks for that Pete and uh, yeah thanks for all the questions coming in there's, there's been quite a lot of questions which um, as I, said, I don't think we're probably going to be able to answer all of them now, but we will try and pick up on them and um, circulate some responses after the event. Um, there's a couple picking up on some of the um, points about identification. Um, the first one of which is when you count the spots on a ladybird, do you include the spots on the pronotum or is it just the ones on the, on the elytra, on the wing cases? So who? Uh, sorry, I'm supposed to be saying who I'm no, directing right. that to. So you I'll go that for it. Pete. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, is the is the short answer. So just include the ones on the wing cases. It's a really good question because, for example, the 22 spot ladybird has got all these other little spots on the pronotum, but you're counting just the ones on the two wing cases. Okay, and perhaps a, a follow on from that one, the other identification question was um, going back to the harlequins. Um, and I think that is one that people struggle with sometimes. Have you got any other tips, Pete, about what's the best way to pick out the harlequins from the others? The harlequin is a tricky one because it's so variable. That's the trouble. So it's certainly from photos, as Helen suggested earlier, it can look very like a 10 spot ladybird. This it's really a combination of looking at the size and so it's a relatively large ladybird uh, looking at the spot patterns and looking at the color of the legs can be useful so pale legs brown or red as opposed to black another little feature that's useful with harlequins is it has a little ridge uh, on the back of the wing cases usually and that can be a, a useful feature to uh, to look out for uh, I if you if you see them you sort of gradually get your eye in but certainly that is a, a, one of the trickier ones the, yeah. the black forms of the harlequin ladybird are perhaps a little bit easier if you see a big black and red ladybird with uh, kind of some white markings on it it's very likely to be a harlequin yeah, we still get caught out sometimes between those as well. Sometimes when Pete and I are verifying records and I record behind the scenes, we'll share some of those more tricky ones with one another just to have that um, second opinion. So, yeah, we completely understand it can be a bit tricky. OK, a um, couple of questions about the sort of natural history of ladybirds. Um, and first one is how broad is the food range? Um, and I, yeah, I suppose some, uh, some general questions about the sort of range of things that ladybirds eat, but also the range of things that eat ladybirds, where do, where do they fit into those sort of food chain situations? Oh, that's a really wonderful question. And um, so as we've been through some of those pictures already, there are some of them, the ladybirds that feed on plants and some that feed on mildew, but the vast majority are predatory in one way or another. And they either feed on aphids or scale insects. So some of the, the pine ladybird that Pete showed towards the end um, is a scale insect feeding ladybird. And for example, the seven spot ladybird is um, an aphid feeding ladybird on the whole. But these are, of course, very broad patterns. And actually, some of these predatory ladybirds, they will eat one another. 
and many of them will eat each other within the same species. So often when a ladybird first hatches from its egg, um, if any of its um, siblings are around and unhatched, the first thing it will do is feed on one of the unhatched eggs. So they do have quite a broad, um, quite a broad diet. Um, and there are a number of things that will also eat them. So as we've already mentioned, their bright colors are suggesting that they're distasteful for many things. Um, it's warning coloration. So there aren't that many predators that eat them, although occasionally you might see one tangled up in a spider's um, web. And um, there's evidence to suggest that spiders will actually feed on them when they're in the web. Um, but on the whole, they don't get eaten by many predators. Some birds will, will take them on the wing, but there have been reports of birds spitting them out um, when they're flying along, for instance. But they have some amazing parasites and, and they really fascinate me. So some people at the moment are sending through on Twitter in an eye record, um, ladybirds sat on a little tiny kind of cocoon, um, looks like a little wheat grain or a little seed, and they're right over the top of it. And that little um, cocoon is of a little wasp called Dinocampus coccinelli and it's lived out its life inside the ladybird as a little larva and it's emerged to pupate um, and there's a whole variety of other parasites we can provide a link in some more information to some of the the parasites of ladybirds um, and some of the diseases that they also encounter but yeah it's a fascinating world of, of what eats them and what they eat great question yeah Thanks, Helen. Um, one of our younger audience members also asked about the relationship between spiders and ladybirds, which mm. you touched on just there. But um, is it the case that they occasionally get eaten by spiders? And perhaps if I can add a supplementary one, do you know it, is the, the toxins in ladybirds, are they distasteful to spiders? Do we know? Yeah, it's really interesting because there, there are, of that I know, there are two scientific papers. So that's often how we communicate in this world is through scientific papers. And, and one showing that um, spiders capturing, for example, the harlequin ladybird, but then not feeding on them. And another showing that the spiders do feed on them. So I think it's an area that needs a lot more investigation. So perhaps the, the young person asking that question might like to look in it in a little bit more detail and certainly begin to look in spiders' webs and see how often they encounter um, ladybirds in those webs. That would be fascinating. But it's a really excellent question as to um, whether they detect those, those chemicals. Great. Um, perhaps if we deal with one more question now, I'll, I'll direct this one to you, Pete, and then we'll, we'll, I think we've got another question session at the end. We can hopefully pick up on a few more. But there's an interesting one here from um, somebody who uh, works as an education officer in a, in a park situation and um, quite often encounters um, children who've been told by their parents or teachers that they mustn't get too close to ladybirds because they're, they're poisonous. And um, do you have any recommendations as to how to respond to, to that sort of attitude? Yeah, I would say um, they really shouldn't worry. Um, uh, as Helen kind of alluded to earlier, Helen, uh, ladybirds are very slightly toxic to, to predators, but not really to, to people. Um, uh, so they're, they're not dangerous. They can give you a tiny um, bite if you're unlucky, but it really doesn't, uh, doesn't usually hurt. A very few people get an allergic reaction to some ladybirds, but it's really very rare. And so as insects go, they're very safe and there's, there's largely no problem at all in, in people handling them or if, if they land on them or whatever. So people shouldn't worry. Yeah, I mean, I've worked on ladybirds for decades and decades, and only once in the field, a little seventh spot to decided to take a, a small nibble, and it was nothing, you know, it, I, I only it barely noticed it. And I think that, that um, what's really fascinating as well about this kind of um, defensive chemistry, if you like, that they have is they will, when disturbed, they will reflex bleed, it's called. They exude a sort of sticky yellow substance. And actually, it's thought that the sort of physical nature of that sticky yellow substance that comes out of their knees, for instance, is actually more of putting to the predators than is the actual distastefulness that goes along with it. Um, so really, they don't, um, they, they're more distasteful than they are toxic for sure. Okay, thanks for, for covering those and uh, we'll we'll pick up on some questions at the, the end of the session now I think but uh, we, we carry on with the presentations. Is it back to you now Helen? It's back to me and I'm going to switch off my um, webcam and move on to to talk a little more. So in terms of making a record we're 
really so pleased to receive records from all of you and many of you have probably made records in the past and your contributions have been so valuable to us and it's just such a pleasure for us to be behind the scenes of the Ladybird survey checking through your records and seeing what you're seeing we get this wonderful view of the country from a Ladybird perspective um, on, a, on a daily basis it's absolutely fantastic so you can use iRecord and register within iRecord and submit your records um, within there and also to say you know there are many other schemes and societies that you might like to contribute to and we can certainly perhaps talk about them in another webinar sometime. We have a, a website, we're part of the um, Beetle um, website that's hosted by the Biological Record Centre and you can find out lots of information um, within that. We have a smartphone app for, um, it's called the European Ladybird app because we work with lots of people across, across Europe who are interested in recording ladybirds too. And so we've put together this app so you can record anywhere across Europe when we're eventually allowed to be out and about again. Um, but you can use that one in your gardens for now. But there's also an iRecord app that you can download if that's more straightforward for you. Just have one app on your phone, on your smartphone smartphone to record. Um, you can drop us an email or send us some spreadsheets or any other ways that you might like to get involved. We're just really happy to hear from you and just so grateful to all of the records um, that come our way. There's lots of resources out there now that you can take a look at and I always love these Field Study Council um, fold out charts. I think they're absolutely fantastic and I will say as well they make really um, excellent birthday cards um, just to um, make that suggestion for you. I think they're, they're fantastic and um, last year we published the Field Guide to Ladybirds of Britain and Ireland um, with the illustrations from the wonderful Richard Lewington. They're absolutely stunning and that field guide covers all of the ladybirds um, of Britain and Ireland, both these charismatic conspicuous ones and the inconspicuous ones that Pete's going to tell you a little bit more about um, in a moment. Um, so lots of places to find out about um, ladybirds and we really look forward to receiving um, your records. So I thought I'd just share with you for a few moments the ways in which we have used the data. And that was a really excellent question that we had early on about the uses of the data. And, and, and I don't have time here to tell you all of the different ways in which we've made use of the data and in which, for example, master's students and PhD students have also benefited hugely from the data that you provide. But perhaps the most um, fascinating story in some ways from the data is that of the Harlequin ladybird. So we first had a record in 2004 and this animated map shows you quite how the Harlequin ladybird just swept across through England into Wales and slowing down as it approached into Scotland. We wouldn't have been able to, to, to see that spread had it not been for all of your records. We knew when the Harlequin ladybird first arrived, it's a species that's um, native to Asia, but was introduced into mainland Europe as a biological control agent. Um, we knew when it was first recorded in um, the UK that there was nothing that could be done about it. But it was just wonderful to have the opportunity to work with so many of you to record what the Harlequin ladybird did within the UK in terms of how rapidly it spread, but also to begin to look at some of the very detailed natural history. And I already mentioned it from one of the questions, this little parasite. So at the very top on the right hand side of this slide, um, you can see that little cocoon underneath that seven spot ladybird. That is a parasite, Dinocampus coccinelli. The next slide down, the next picture down shows a little forehead fly that also parasitizes ladybirds. And at the very bottom is a little fungus um, called Hesperomyces that um, grows on the surface of ladybirds. And we were able to do some work looking at how these might be interacting with the Harlequin ladybird. And certainly in the early stages of invasion, we showed that the Harlequin ladybird is really resistant um, to those things that are attacking our native ladybirds. So that was really fascinating. And slowly what we're now seeing with some of your records coming through is that some of these parasites seem to be adapting to the Harlequin ladybird and, and we're getting records of them with the Harlequin ladybird. So that's just um, one of the stories that has been revealed through your fantastic um, data. But we're also able to look at um, the trends in these species by looking at all of these records and working with some amazing statistical modelers within the Biological Record Center. And um, we published these trends in an atlas um, back in uh, 2011. But um, in the field guide, we updated them um, with the latest information we have. And in some ways, it's a depressing story that perhaps we've, we've got quite used to in the media of decline of insects. And there's lots of species that we're seeing declines for. 
And Adelia bipunctata, for instance, this two-spot ladybird pictured right over um, to the left is one that's shown a really strong decline, positively correlated with the harlequin ladybird. The harlequin ladybird will eat a number of different ladybirds, but it's also a very strong competitor for those aphids. So we've got lots of reasons to explain um, these declines, but of course we've got a lot more um, to find out too. I'll just sweep across to the very end of that graph and look at Coxinella hieroglyphica because this is one that Pete and I have really tried hard to find in recent years. We've both got records of it from the past, but we struggle to see it. But what's so exciting to me is that a number of people, and maybe you're um, in this webinar, have been recording them in Scotland from your back gardens, which is just so exciting. And I think it shows you that there's discoveries to be made on your door step and um, we would love to hear about them. So some of the species are increasing. That beautiful orange ladybird, which Pete showed to you, which is one of my favorites, the um, mildew feeding orange ladybird, used to be thought it was very much associated with ancient um, woodlands, but it started to spread out from there. And um, we've really seen it surging in terms of um, populations and also its distribution um, across the UK. And um, so that's one species that we're certainly seeing on the increase. Pete's going to chat to you a little bit about some of these little tiny ladybirds, and in particular the rhizobius in a moment, but we're seeing changes in their patterns as well. And perhaps not surprisingly, of course, the harlequin ladybird is one um, that has been increasing um, since its arrival in um, 2004. So that was just a quick introduction to some of the ways in which we're using the data. Um, and I thought it'd be a, a good opportunity to take a few more of your, your questions. I'll switch back on my camera and Pete will switch back on his and Martin will come back and help us out. Thank you, Martin. Thanks, Pete. Okay. Um, where shall we go with that? Okay. Uh, we will take a look at all of these questions. I, I, one this question. Time. Sorry, Martin, you carry on. Yes, yes, okay. One question relating to the distribution is um, a question about the Channel Islands and whether we whether there are any differences in the range of ladybirds that are found on the Channel Islands. Pete, do you want and, to go? Uh, sure. Yeah, Channel Islands is a great place for ladybirds, actually. Um, uh, so being quite far south, you, you know, there tend to be more species in warmer, more southerly parts of the UK, uh, as a rule. Um, and the Channel Islands also has one or two species that you would perhaps find in France and in mainland Europe that we don't have, uh, or certainly as many um, numbers of in the UK. So, I mean, one of those, there's a very rare species in the UK called the 13 spot ladybird which is much more common in the Channel Islands. And there are a couple of additional species there uh, as well. So yeah, Channel Islands is, is great for, for ladybirds, as a, perhaps as a sort of stopping off point for some of them. Great, okay. Um, so a couple of questions relating to the sort of um, pest control aspect of ladybird ecology. So uh, Perhaps if I direct the next one, Helen, are there any studies showing that ladybirds are useful species in terms of pest reduction in arable environments particularly? That is a really excellent question. And there certainly are studies. And indeed, there are some studies coming from North America showing the value of the harlequin ladybird in terms of controlling pest aphids um, within crop systems. Um, so they definitely play their part. I think, you know, increasingly over the years, we're realizing that actually it's the complex kind of interactions between many different species that can help us with things like pest control. So we can't just rely on ladybirds, for instance, and we can't just rely on parasitic wasps or ground beetles or lace wings or hoverflies or all of the other many species um, that perform this role. But when we have them all together, that's when um, the control is really powerful. So certainly these insects play a vital role in um, agricultural ecosystems, but they perform that vital role as a, as a collection of species working together. I think it's always really fascinating with the ladybirds, for instance, that you know, different ones of them are active at different parts of the day or indeed different parts of the season as well. And then they all fit together in this sort of amazing jigsaw um, to, to provide these really important ecosystem functions for us. Okay, 
And, and Peter, picking up on a slightly related question, um, we've been asked if there are any issues with the commercially supplied ladybird larvae that you can buy for garden aphid control. Is, is that a good thing? Are there any concerns about that? Yeah, I would dis I would discourage people from from buying them um, on the whole. I mean, they're, they're they're probably very expensive, and it's not a, perhaps a very viable way of controlling your pest insects in, uh, in the garden. But also, some of them might not be the species that you you might expect. Occasionally, you know, there might be non-native species introduced in this way. And even if they're native ones, they might be from a, they might be slightly genetically different from the, the ones of that species in your area. So I would um, discourage that really. Maybe in glass houses up to a point, it might be a bit safer, but uh, otherwise I'd say not a good idea. I think there's so many ways you can actually, um, I've got a shield bug just arrived on my window, I have to say that's very distracting. Um, there, there are so many different ways in which you can promote um, lovely habitats within your own back gardens that can encourage ladybirds to come and live um, alongside you and indeed some of these other beneficial insects as well and also pollinating insects too. Um, you know, Having a, a rose plant, for example, covered in um, aphids or allowing a few aphids to be on your bean plants or peas um, is really fantastic. Um, we have alongside my house some nettles. I know that's not ideal for everyone, um, but nettle patches can be fantastic in terms of providing an early source of aphids um, for ladybirds and other things that benefit from feeding on aphids. So I think allowing some of that those refuges for ladybirds within your back garden is a great way to encourage that biological control within your garden. Okay. Um, perhaps we just pick up on a couple more questions. Now, there's another one from one of the um, younger members of the audience, um, and, and that is, um, again, perhaps if I direct this one to you, Pete, why are harlequin ladybirds considered bad? Um, Helen actually mentioned a positive use or, or benefit from them just now, but um, they, they do have quite a bad reputation, don't they? So where does that come from? Yeah, so um, the, the, the thing we're concerned about is really the effect that they may have on some other insect species, um, particularly some of the other ladybirds is, has been the focus of some of some of our work. So they do directly feed on, uh, and it's mainly the larvae that are doing this rather than the adults, but the harlequin larvae may eat other ladybird uh, larvae. Now other ladybirds do this too. Uh, it's not that the harlequin is, is bad and the others are good as such, but the harlequin's very good at it. And because it's sort of outside of its native range and perhaps doesn't have all of the um, kind of natural enemies and things keeping it, uh, it, it does do really well here. And um, so we are concerned from the point of view of its effect on other ladybirds, although, you know, the evidence isn't entirely um, straightforward on that. So uh, that's that's the thing on that one. Okay. Um, I'm picking up on a slightly different issue just to finish the questions in, in this section. Um, and this is relating to the um, recording scheme activities, really, Helen. And the question is, I've just lost one with it. Uh, where's it gone? Yeah. So how do you deal with the um, any potential bias and the misidentification mm -hmm. potential in record and science? So I have to say you are all fantastic at the identification and the whole most of the records we get are correctly identified and Pete and I check out um, all of those records and um, we let you know if you submitted a photo for instance and it's not the species you thought it was, um, we let you know and we try and explain a little bit about why it's not what you thought it was. So we know that we have a fantastic data set because of all of you and then also, when we're using it in our analysis, there are a whole variety of ways in which we can correct for the fact that, of course, there are more people recording in some parts of the country than other parts of the country, or indeed in some habitats compared to other habitats. So we use statistical methods to enable us to account for those kind of patterns of bias, if you like, um, within within the data. But yeah, we work very hard with statisticians and um, we work very hard in, in checking through the data. And um, we're just very grateful that you send it all in so we have it to use. Okay, so um, I, 
I'm, I'm, I'm slightly lost track of the agenda now, Helen. Where, what, few, what's happening we next? have a so few another... more slides, but we are going to finish on time. We're aware that <laughs> it is already now seven minutes left yeah. of our time. Um, it, it whizzes by when we're talking about Lady Reds. We're going to go back to a few more slides. Thank you ever so much, Martin, for putting those questions. And we'll come back to some final questions right at the end if we still have time. And I'll switch off my camera. OK, thanks, Helen. So just to spend a very few minutes introducing you to some of the really tiny ladybirds, the what we call the inconspicuous ones. All of the species we've spoken about so far are um, slightly larger and, <clears throat> excuse me, slightly more colorful uh, species and they tend to be very smooth and shiny in appearance but we have a whole range of other ladybird species that uh, some of which can occur quite commonly in gardens so we'd like people to perhaps have a look out for some of these this is a, a plate from um, uh, the field guide so this is drawings by Richard Lewington and I'm just going to touch briefly on three examples of these little tiny ladybirds so we can see the next slide please so the first one is called the red flanked skimness and you can see the sort of scale of this uh, when you put that ladybird alongside a 5p piece so really is pretty tiny it's sort of one and a half to two millimeters and certainly with my eyesight uh, I, I need a hand lens in order to properly uh, be able to tell these little ladybirds apart but if you've got a, a, a good magnifier, then th uh, that's possible. Um, so some of these are cropping up quite commonly in gardens. This little red flank skimness has got these uh, red front spots, which kind of go right down to the, the edges and, and front of the wing case. It's kind of triangular shaped spots. And this is a species that's really been around for the last um, 25 years or so in the UK and seems to be spreading and it's mostly in southeast England but uh, last year we had records from for example Derbyshire and I think also Devon so spreading a little bit and um, you know one that you might find in, in gardens uh, lots of different things it might be on different trees and shrubs next one please Ivy can be quite a good place to look for some of these little ladybirds and by the way most of them are hairy so they might look a little bit sort of matte in appearance and I think you can see on this uh, nephus the four spotted nephus you can see the little fine hairs on it this is a beautiful little species that you can find uh, in some places quite commonly kind of scuttling around on on ivy I know Helen's found it uh, very local locally to, to where she is in Oxfordshire it's got four uh, little spots and the front ones are kind of at a, almost at right angles as you can see on the picture again pretty tiny about two millimeters uh, and one that's probably rather under recorded it may be in many of your uh, gardens but you, you just need to look very carefully on ivy and the next one final one of these uh, little ladybirds to mention this is actually one of the the biggest of the uh, inconspicuous ladybirds it's a very new species to Britain and we we don't have a common name for this one so this one is just called Rhizobius forestieri and it was first recorded only about six years ago and has slowly been spreading in southern England um, but again starting to be found a, a little bit further north um, it's a it's a black ladybird with very sort of um, obvious white or silvery looking hairs on it as you can see from the picture here uh, maybe that just looks like a black beetle to you but it is most of the features are very ladybird like and if you flip it over a really good identification um, aid for this one is looking at the underside and you can see this bright orange abdomen on the left hand picture that can be a really useful way of identifying this one um, so this is found on a number of different trees so far we're not exactly sure of its habitat requirements in the UK but uh, the only time I found it was on a lime tree other people found it on things like ash and yew and ivy again and even holly euonymus things like that so another one to look out for and the next one please so that really brings us uh, to a close and we'll use any last moments we have for any other questions but we'd really like to thank you all again for your 
joining the webinar and we'd also like to thank all of the providers of the images that we've used. Most of these photos aren't ours but they belong to people that have contributed them in the UK Ladybird survey. So all the names on here and we hope we haven't forgotten anybody are people that contributed photos to our uh, talk. Please do uh, have a look at some of the other resources that Helen mentioned if you get the chance. And we have a website and a very active um, uh, Twitter that Helen mostly deals with. And uh, there's also a nice Facebook page. So lots of ways that you can interact with us uh, if you wish to. So thank you very much. And if there are, if there is a, a moment or two for any final questions, Martin, maybe we've got one minute. Yes, yeah, so I think we just have uh, about one minute. and. Um... But we can take, a, perhaps we'll take a final question and then we can say our, our final goodbyes. Um, yeah, great. Well, um, first of all, very thanks very much to Helen and Pete for um, taking us through all that. It's been fascinating to, to see those presentations. We have had quite a lot of questions and we are still getting quite a lot of questions. So as, as we've been saying, we will try and pick up on as many as we can after the event. Um, couple relating to the inconspicuous species that you've just been talking about, Pete. Um, you mentioned that quite a lot of them are fairly sort of hairy species. Is what, What's the reason for that? What's the benefit of them having hairs? Well, that's a good question. I mean, I think these species are tending to go for sort of camouflage rather than advertising their um, toxicity, if you like, by having warning coloration. So I think having the hairs, maybe it also helps with insulation to some extent, although I'm not sure about that. Yeah, but it's a bit difficult to have sound, I think, Pete. Oh, sorry. Is that? Are you hearing me okay now? I'm hearing you. Are you he you hearing me, Helen? Yeah, I'm hearing you. Um, I don't know what other people are hearing, but it's gone. Oh, I've gone. <laughs> I, th I think it might be Martin's part because Martin's your screen was freezing a little, but I can hear you, Pete, and I hope everyone else okay. can. But I'm going to try turning off my webcam because that uh, might help a little bit. But maybe now's the time for us to begin to conclude. Anyway, I, I think, yeah, I mean, that's a really wonderful question about the hairiness and not one I've thought about a huge amount, but I, I think that it would also add to their kind of defensive okay, I'm armory. Not quite sure what everybody else is. It's all gone quiet on at, at my end of things at the moment. Okay. Well, Martin, we're, we're, we're hearing you, but I, I think we're going to wrap up now, aren't we, Helen? Yeah, we are. Yep. Yeah. So thank you to everyone for being with us today and um, for all of your amazing records. We have just the most fantastic um, Ladybird recording community and um, we look forward to all of your records coming in. And if you want to find out any more about Ladybirds, get in touch with us. Or if you want to know more about schemes or societies, please let us know um, and we will tell you more about recording, um, particularly at this time in your back garden. But Meanwhile, thank you for giving this time to the Ladybirds over lunchtime. And um, we look forward to seeing you all again in one way or another. Thanks. And thank you, Martin. Thank you, Caroline. And thank you, Pete. I'll say goodbye now. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.